Acts 1.12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Jesus ascended. What are they going to do? What are you going to do? Jesus, he's gone in the clouds. And, and here, here they are, the disciples, uh, having it a little more together now. Uh, based on what's already happened. So I think they know better. And they immediately go and start preparing for, for his return. In their mind, something else is going to happen. Maybe he's going to come back. He's talking about the spirit thing uh, coming. Joel, the prophecy, we still have that in mind. They, they could very well still be thinking about that. But uh, mindsets are being broken down, Uh, walls are being broken down, perceptions are changing, because that's what what Jesus does. Now, their expectation was high because they'd walked with him. They'd they'd seen everything. They, They know that he rose from the dead now. He ascended, but still, they're not fully understanding what does this promise of the Spirit mean? I don't know, but something cool is going to happen. Let's go to the upper room, basically. Now, they didn't know that in 2024, in the 21st century, we'd still be here waiting for his return, preparing. And they didn't know that what they were about to receive in the upper room would still be guiding the church. And here we are this morning, a product of that, a product of what happened in the upper room. So we, how... How we are preparing for his return now has to be defined by what Jesus was establishing through his church, through what he did on the cross, what he did um, at the resurrection, what he did in the ascension, right? He fulfilled Daniel 7.13, sitting at the right hand of the Father, Reigning, interceding for who? For this community of believers, for a people of God, for all of us. To do what? To carry on his purposes now. He's not physically here. Need the Holy Spirit for that. And that's our mission. So we're not just we're not just a community. We're a kingdom community. And hence the title of this series. Kingdom simply means what? You know, what do you mean by that? Kingdom is defined as you're being ruled by a king. It's just being under the reign of a king. And that's what we are. Jesus is our king. And a community is a group of people sharing a common mission. In Acts, we see how this community advanced. Starting in an upper room. And like I mentioned last, last week, the last time they were in the upper room, possibly the same one, we really don't know, it doesn't matter, it was an upper room. Um, this one's probably John Mark's home, because you see that later on in Acts chapter 12, they're there, so it's probably John Mark's home. Um, the last time they had left the upper room, they forsake Jesus, they flee, he's crucified, they're cowards. But the resurrection changed everything. They return to this room with a purpose now. And that purpose held them all together. Now, when they got to the upper room, they were not in separate corners doing their own thing. You know, all right, let's go hang out here and wait. And you got one scrolling Facebook and the other binge watching Netflix. You got a group, group over here playing chess or something. Somebody back there playing Minecraft with VR goggles or I don't know. Um, It it wasn't like that. 
They weren't in their individual cliques. You know, this group over here and this one, the Hawkeyes over here, the Hawkeye fans and uh, Iowa State. Is that the other one? And what else do you have? That's about it. Is that right? I don't know. I don't know. Yellow and red. That's all I know. So, Caitlin Clark. That's all I know. She's cool. Um, th- it wasn't broken up like that. They were of one accord. Of one accord, the Bible says. And that is, that word is the most, is the complete description of what we're supposed to be in the church. So the first thing they had was unity. That's your point number one. The Greek word for one accord, or some of your translations say one mind. Some of your translations say together, and I would go with the other ones first because it's a, it's a little bit stronger, but it's the homothemadon in the Greek, and it means inner unity of a group of people engaged in similar action, and it's usually, most every time it's tied to, in the Bible, a location and a number of people. So it's specific. In the New Testament, it's talking about an inner uh, unanimity. Una- I'm not going to try that word. Unanimously, unanimity. I think I did that right. Of the community. So meaning, we're it's unanimous. We're we're here for Jesus, basically. And the actions that are making up this community are going to reflect the risen Lord. The res- the resurrection has an, an important factor in here because later on when they choose Judas's replacement, it has to be someone who's been there since John's baptism, since Jesus came on the scene to the resurrection because the resurrection is what brought it all together. The actions that we, com- that we practice or, or, or do as a church, um, we listen to teaching I would say apostolic teaching, and I don't know what you associate with that word, but that just simply means the apostles, the, the, the 12, the, the apostles who wrote scripture, that teaching, the stuff that's in the Bible, and I won't include the apocrypha for that, but the canonized scripture. Um, breaking bread, communion, worship, prayer. So we come together. This is what we've been doing weekly, Since the first century. But together means more than just being in the same room or in the same building or in the same denomination or in the same town. It it means we are unanimously passionate about learning about Jesus, following Jesus, knowing him, And then in turn, also loving one another. Because we are the physical representatives. We are the physical representatives. Paul says ambassadors, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, the ambassadors for Christ. So we're representing Jesus Christ in this world. And we're representing the nature of how this kingdom operates. And that kingdom, it cannot be divided. It can't be. It's it's God's kingdom. So we have to strive to be united. And I'll ask this morning, rhetorical of course, but are we of one accord every time we come together? I would say, you know, I think so. It's hard to know, right? Um, Well, there is a way to know. But it's difficult in in a community of people like this. I look around different ages, different backgrounds, different genders, different um, ethnicities. Cultures, affiliations, agendas, uh, political leanings, histories. We got a lot. We got a mixed bag. It's a, um, it's a melting pot, right? 
I mean, for the most part, we are in Northwest Iowa, but um, there are other influences in, in this world to affect our minds. So when we come together like this, especially with people from all different walks of life, it is hard. And that's because of what happens outside of the, the context, what should be the context of the church, and that is the, king, the other kingdoms that we're battling. And I'm talking about principalities and powers that you don't see with your eyes or, or hear with your ears, but they're there, and those are seeking to, to devour and divide, especially the church, red target on the church, all week long, influencing us in, in this world system, a, yes, a Babylonian system, is anger, influences of anger, of, of pride, of lust, of um, carnal desires, right? We're, you're bombarded with them. The influences of the world, they lead us in the body of Christ to gossip about one another, to murder, murder people in our minds. And that, that's through hatred, and that's just propagated through outside influences in the world. Destroy rather than build up, and that's because Satan loves to divide. Satan wants a divided church. He wants factions. He wants cliques. He wants that side to never speak to that side. He wants this church to never speak to that church. You know what I mean? So from the first century to the 21st century, the warnings from the apostles still remain. I'll use James 4... One through four this morning. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. He's talking to the church. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, pastor, are you saying that I can be an enemy of God and be a Christian? I, I didn't say it. James just said it. Because he's talking to believers. When we're in one accord, when we're united we are a friend of God when we're united. We are less likely to speak against one another, hate one another, avenge, have to go around and defend ourselves to protect our reputation and tear down other people. So it's the unity that the one accord thing that we'll get to that we have to protect at all costs. And then that unity is protecting the church from division. And because of that, kingdom work continues and people are saved. And people's lives are changed and they're coming into a united, not a divided body. Who wants to come into a church that's divided? No one ever. Yeah, I came in that church and, you know, I saw them, they were talking about each other and the other one was giving one someone dirty looks and they're all messed up and divided. If I wanted that, I just, I'm going to go out there. My job is divided enough. Goodness. Beatrice is gossiping constantly behind the computer at the cubicle and, and my boss is cheating on his wife. You know, it's, it's divided. I don't know where those names came from. Beatrice. Um... <laughs> Maybe one of somebody needs prayer named Beatrice. So we're protecting unity because that's it. people's lives are going to be changed by that. It's for the kingdom work. But how do you stay united? How do we all stay united? Look at us. Look at us. I mean, look at these people. I mean, look at this list. The Holy Spirit hadn't even come yet, but guess what? They had 10 days to prepare, so here we go. They had 10 days to get into agreement, and one way that they did it would be number two, and that's through prayer. 
Prayer is important. In the original Greek, actually, in the original Greek, it says they were devoting themselves to the prayers. There's a definite article there. So that suggests something. Because I don't know about you, and, and I, you know, I was, I was saved through Teen Challenge. All I've known is, all I've known is Pentecostal my whole life, right? I mean, assemblies of God. When I picture the upper room, I picture people just pacing and seeking after God and laid out on the floor and maybe running around and like emotional, exuberant prayers, shouting out, flamboyant. But in reality, we, we have to look at the context of where, what's going on here. Um, the prayers means they actually had prayers memorized. Okay. They had scrolls that they were reading prayers from. Now, it doesn't mean that they weren't doing other prayers, of course. But they were, this is a pilgrimage. They're on a pilgrimage to one of the most important festivals. This is the time that they're in. The Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, celebrating the uh, deliverance from, the, uh, from Egypt into the Promised Land. It's a big deal. And they're going to the temple. They would have been, actually, they would have been reading the story of Ruth. And isn't that interesting? The story of Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite who's converted to Judaism. Isn't that a little hint that God's going to do something? A hint that he's going to reach all nations. And it, it just happens to be a story about a woman. So they would have also been reading the Hallel Psalms, which it would include a psalm like this, and I'll read Psalm 113, 1 through 9 this morning, they would have surely had this. It was appropriate during that time. It says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. They'd be, they, I mean, is that okay? I don't know about you, but I've said, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't need to recite prayers. I just have prayers on my heart. You know, that, that was kind of foolish of me to say that, kind of. It was a dumb statement I've said in the past, I guess. Because you can very well have the word of God and pray that. And it's powerful. It was just, it was still powerful now. And this is what they're doing. All these upper room believers. And, and the psalm is, says, ruler of all nations. They're talking about all nations already. He, they're talking about the one who is going to rescue the poor and needy. And have them sit with princes. Because this is what God does. The God who can make the barren woman have a home and, and uh, make her the mother of children. What, what, of course, you know, and we have Hannah's prayer and stuff integrated in that, but a, 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 a barren woman who never has, may, maybe she has spiritual children if she doesn't have actual children. So powerful stuff. And without context, it's easy to abandon the history of the Old Testament. And it is so rich with prophetic, it's a witness, prophetic witness, and these connections in this Old Testament, they help shape the community that we are in now. So we can't just say, well, I'm just going to read the New Testament. I'm just a New Testament reader. We have to read the whole thing. And the kingdom community that God planned all along, and guess what? 
it was not just 12 Jewish men. It was far more than that. Because God had great plans through, the, through those men, through those apostles. So number three is diverse. Diverse. And please hear what I'm saying this morning. Because this is the time that we live in, I have to do this. And I'm probably going to have to do it for a long time. The word diverse or diversity in our time has negative connotations by evangelicals. But it should not in the proper context. It's not a socio-political term. That's not how I'm using it this morning. So just you like eject that out of your mind. It's a kingdom term. This is the body of Christ. It's clearly what the kingdom of God, the people of God is and was and was always meant to be. Diverse. Jesus did not die and raise from the dead and ascend to heaven for us to have churches divided by denomination, cliques, ethnicity, social status. Like with, each, like with each church to be okay, and this is the American church, right? I want to go to a church that kind of, it feels like that's my kind of people, you know? Or I want to go to the church that fits my needs, like makes me feel at home. I understand what we mean by that. You know, we, we hope this feels like home to you. To test what that means, whether it's right or wrong, we have to test the, 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 the meaning of what you mean by home. But I just, I, I, I need to find a place where they think like me, you know? Like, I don't know. Um, if you're a Hawkeye fan, you just want a church full of Hawkeyes fans. I'm just going to use that to lighten up the, right? Yeah, we don't want these other, but that, that, that's it. And we're looking for that. And you know why? Because it's so easy to have unity when you all think alike. When we all look alike. When we all talk the same, we're all using the same terms. We're all rooting for the same teams. But the point is we should fit in because of the spirit of God, not because of what people look, think, talk, act like around us. That's why we fit in. It's the spirit of God. It's Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. There's just one. And here, here we are. They're, they're waiting for Pentecost. So it sounds like, sounds like what Paul is talking about is what in the upper room they're preparing for. And it sounds like it's probably going to be like, I don't know, a reversal of Babel, a reversal of division, something that's going to unite people from all walks of life. A uniting of nat nations, a uniting of cultures, a uniting of uh, people with a stained past, you know, sinners. I mean, look at the list in Acts 1.12. You have 11 men, soon to be 12, of course, Judas is going to be replaced because they have to bring it up to 12. Mainly fishermen, just fishermen, just Jewish fishermen. A zealot, that, that's, okay, that's your, a zealot is just equated to the most extreme political person you have ever want to meet. So that's a zealot, nationalist. Um, tax collector, a crook, not very, not looked at as very highly, especially by, especially by the Jews. So a sellout to Rome, a sellout to the man. So the ones least expected but chosen by Jesus to lead the way. But it was more than them. Because who else was there? There's a whole group of people there. And we don't know. We don't know their names. There are most likely, there's most likely former uh, Pharisees there. I don't know, like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. 
crazy mix of people. It was radical. Prostitutes, yeah? Jesus went and redeemed prostitutes. People who committed adultery. Criminals. Lepers, once called unclean by the outcast society. Rich, poor, everything. And now they're committed and they're in this upper room living in this newly created family. And then also Luke, Luke makes sure to mention that they were together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, meaning Jesus' brothers, half-brothers, right? So Jesus' own family, who once called him crazy, they thought he was out of his mind. Which a lot of family, that's kind of how family is, right? If your family is like, hey, I'm the Messiah, and I'm going to change the world, you'd be like, whatever, you know. <laughs> I grew up with you, okay? Or if you were the older sibling, I, I changed your diaper. And you're gonna, I'm not going to believe you. So that, they didn't receive him. And often we think, and, and I've done this too, of course, we think, yeah, you know, you've got to forsake family for for Jesus, and I, I, I'm sure I've used that verse, but we forget that there is a restoration here. We forget there's a change that happens, and it's based on the resurrection. Out of the resurrection, of course, the death and resurrection. So, Mark three twelve, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he's out of his mind. So this is James, James and Jude, who have this is who wrote the scripture. I mean, they actually wrote scripture. So they at one time mocked him. What changed them? The resurrection. Because this is after the resurrection. Now they're sold out. Okay, I guess we'll believe him now. I guess, well, I mean, he's alive. I see his hands and feet. Um, we just watched him ascend, right? So yes, we can still preach um, and know that our family can be saved, but keep in mind there's a change now because it's not about blood anymore. It's not about blood. It's, you're, you're now you're in a different kind of family. The relationship changed because he calls us all. When I said Ron is my brother, it's, it's like actually my brother. This is how this works. Jesus knew that because in that culture, and in, in a lot of, I'd say in America too, and we do have, you know, we have a lot of different people who come to America, so different traditions and things. We value family so much. He, he wants us to focus on not the blood family, but the family of God. All of us are related. We're all children of God, Matthew twelve forty eight. So even his, even his brothers are, are here. And then last but not least, the women. The women. Which brings us to what Luke purposefully says in here is together with the women. Together with the women. Now that's radical because women um, were a liability in the ancient world. We don't think like that in America. In, in Middle Eastern countries, they still think like that. We don't think like that here, right? For the most part. I know there's still, I mean still. My, my sister, uh, Rhea, is my sister. She works in New York City, and she is a graphic designer. Um, I've seen, even today, how they treat women in that industry. It's shocking to me. I'm like, man, how are you even doing this? Because, um, you know, it's, it's rough. It's rough. Um, but for the most part, we don't think of this. And that's because our society, our culture is, is, not, um, is not valuing as much what they valued. And they valued honor. And um, shame was something they protected that honor from. And women would bring, um, women would bring shame because they're not providing back then. Women didn't bring honor unless they brought children into the family, right? And those children, the honor was if they're male. So 
we have to understand this. And then women, we usually were not allowed to work. We weren't allowed. Sorry, ladies. You weren't, back then, you wouldn't be allowed to work. So that's why when a, when a woman became a widow back then, the reason that the, it was such a big deal, while we even have that verse of, you know, take care of the widows, have you ever thought about why is that such a big deal? Because you have to look in the context of the culture. If, if, if a woman lost her husband and she's a widow, she can't work. So the only way she's going to make money is to become a beggar or a prostitute. So they, we, we need to take care of the widows because that's going to bring shame to be begging for money or be a prostitute. That's the context. But Jesus radically changes this idea that women are less than. Um, and that's because it's a kingdom community. And it's unlike the world had ever seen, and it's still radical, and it's still radical this morning. I mean, look at us. Look, 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 just look around you. Look to your left and right. I mean, this is radical that you all are even in here this morning. And that's because you're in a family. And God doesn't play favorites, and he doesn't make factions. We do that. He brings people together all for the glory of his name. And as I close today in verse 15 of Acts 1, Peter stands up to speak. Not, not yet, Alyssa, just that wasn't your cue. Um, Peter stands up to speak because those, those 11 disciples, Judas is gone. He hung himself, which if you're just reading Luke and Acts, the last time you saw Judas, he kissed Jesus, you know, kissed Jesus and betrayed him. You don't see, and now all of a sudden he's gone. So you'd be like, oh, okay, I guess he died. They had to replace Judas because they had to make the 11, 12, because that's really important. The 12 tribes of Israel. Um, Peter stands up to speak, and then Luke says that they're in the company of a person that was all in all about 120. And this morning, I want to tell you that's not a random number. It wasn't like Luke just said, hey, I'm going to write 120 in there. And it's going to be a great number for everyone to remember. We also have to think in the Jewish context. Now, certain numbers are really significant to uh, Judaism, Jewish practice, practices. And, and, and numbers were used to memorize concepts, to remember things especially for the kids, but they would allude to certain meanings. And this isn't like esoteric Bible code that I'm giving you. This is history, in fact. And you know what? We do this too with numbers, don't we? We do. Um, the number 13, what do you think of immediately when you hear that? Yeah. Unlucky, right? Why? Why do you even think that? Because it's associated with it for some reason. Your birth date, I bet. It's in probably most of your passwords. Your anniversary, to you it's special. It's a number, but it, it's meaning something. So we do this. In Judaism, they'd be here and they'd read these numbers and they had meaning to them. And when they heard 12, they're like, oh yeah, well that's the 12 tribes of Israel. But, but 12, it's completion. 120 here is giving weight to the complete picture of the people of God. It's 12 times 10. 10 is another number. We had 10 commandments, 12 tribes of Israel. It's like complete times complete. So what's the point? It's like Luke is communicating. He's saying this is, you know, it's about, I don't know, the complete picture of what the kingdom of God is going to look like. A whole bunch of people from all different backgrounds coming together and being unified and seeking after the same common purpose. It's interesting to me that the number, the number, the number 120, like, in, in the Bible, if it's, if it's by itself, not like 120,003, but just 120, it's mentioned an exact number of 12 times throughout the whole Bible. It's just a neat fact. 
But the meaning is what matters, and that's because God is a God of completion, and he finishes the work that he starts, not just in you individually as a believer, because we take that to mean for us all the time, hey, yeah, God's going to finish what he started in you. He's going to finish what he started in you. That's great. Yeah, that's true. But he's going to finish what he started in us, his bride and his body. He is not going to stop. We have to cooperate with it. It's a complete work that he does. So we're all part of the complete picture of what it means to be a people of God. We're part of his completion. That's awesome. And he desires that we're on one accord, that we're of one mind this morning and beyond this morning. And that's laying down these petty, petty differences. Ridiculous stereotypes. No matter what we look like or where we come from, being of one accord, Remember that special word in the Greek, the homothemodon. Now, that word for one mind, another cool thing, and man, the Bible is just awesome. I can't. I, that word appears for the first time in this verse of the Bible, Acts 1.14. It's the first time in the Bible that word ever shows up in the Greek. Why is that? I'd say that's important. And if you looked it up, this is mind-blowing to me too. If you look that same word up, guess how many times it shows up in the New Testament? Twelve times. It's just another picture of completion. And every single one is in the book of Acts, and there's except for one. One is in Romans. So Acts is a book of unity. It's all about the, 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 the church coming together. And that's because Jesus died and rose again to complete something in us. And that's a family that transcends your social status. It's a family that transcends your um, family history, your um, marriage history. And I'm, I'm talking about if you had previous marriages, okay? It's a family that surpasses personality types, skin color, gender, race, denomination, age group, any of it. And that's not me. Like I said, this isn't some crazy out there thing. Because I am. When I prepare the messages, I'm like, Lord, can I say gender now? Because, you know, Yeah, this is what the Bible says. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, wow, heirs according to the promise. And then it goes on, if you go down to Galatians 4, 5, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. His children. And because we are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you're no longer a slave, but you're God's own child. You're God's old son, son, son and daughter now. And since you're his child, God made you his, his heir. And that's why he sends the Holy Spirit. Not just to save us into some social club, but to be adopted as family. So that's Jews, Gentiles. And now you can come, Alyssa. Jews, Gentiles, Iowans, Californians, Americans, Peruvians, alcoholics, shopaholics, chocoholics, <laughs> poor and rich. I won't look at anybody there. <laughs> Old and young, male and female. Male and female. And thank God we don't live in that, that rough culture today, but still, this morning we are, you know, we are highlighting in our, in our tradition um, of American tradition a Mother's Day thing, and that's great. 
And we're honoring moms, right? We, but, but really, we honor all women. We, we're honoring all women in ministry context um, in this church. The women from the early church to now, actually, the great, look at all the great women in the Old Testament that God's been using. And they're often taken for granted in ministry and in churches and, yeah, still in the corporate world. But it's the women of the church who have risen up time and time again. So (laughs) we celebrate the birth of the church in one accord, praying and, 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 and seeking God. And today, the ones who have, well, they have the birthing gender. So that's right. Only women can give birth. So women... Are, are, are valued. They're not less than. And you know, men, I'll say to the men this morning, a lot of women will put us to shame. Judy Taylor, I don't know if she's in here this morning. You stir me, sister, because man, you are bold. And um, time and time again, for, for men, for men, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, we're, we're, it's equal, right? But our women have, have done some powerful things. And some of us are alive today just because of their prayers. When many times the men just wouldn't, wouldn't step up. Our ladies, this morning uh, specifically, we want to not honor you by you standing up. Um, and then us clapping, right? Hey, we want to honor all moms in here. We want to honor all women. No, I, I think that, you know, in about five to seven minutes, um, God has a little different plan this morning. Because um, Jesus knows what it's like to come and be rejected by his own, meaning all of humanity. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to not be treated fairly. He knows, um, he knows what it was like for you to go through what you've been through. So this morning, as a few ladies who are ready to pray come up, we're going to honor you by asking this altar call to just be for women in this place. So if those ladies will come up now, where are they? Thank you, ladies. This is ladies only. There is, there is, um, there is loss as a, as a woman today for you. You've experienced loss. It could be loss of reputation. It could be you've, you have lost a child. It could be in your past you did have an abortion and the guilt is just killing you and you've never been free of it and I don't know maybe it's perhaps you just haven't felt comfortable enough getting prayer maybe you're struggling today because this Mother's Day thing really just ticks you off because you don't you know you don't maybe you don't have a good good mother thing going on there well you have you have women of God who are here to pray for you this morning So if you're a lady, if you're a lady and you're struggling, we're going to worship today and honor you by praying. Or maybe you have you have everything fine, and you just you want to be stirred to be used by how the God of a united church wants to use you in ministry, and you felt just without purpose. We're going to pray for you, ladies, this morning. So would you come up? Would you stand to your feet? Everybody, come on. And men, we're not, you know, we're just praying from where we are. Men, if you want to go back and pray for each other and have a men prayer party, go for it. But today it's about these ladies, and we honor them in ministry. In Jesus' name, would you worship this morning?